Good morning. Listen, we have a treat, and um, uh, there's a, um, uh, I was talking to Eileen and Christopher, brand new here. I don't even know where you sat and don't want to embarrass you. And if I was talking with them, and uh, it's their first time here today, and I always like to get out and see some folks and meet some people who are new, um, have this uh, new couple. You know, Jim, yesterday, remember when I said, I'm pretty sure I know that person when we were at, now folks, I'm going to tell you where we were, but don't judge us. We were at Maple Street Biscuit. Yes, we fasted all good food and got three frosted biscuits. I'm going to tell you what, Jim and I were in heaven. Now, we fell asleep there at the table with sugar glaucoma. They found us about three hours later with our faces in the frosting asleep. Man, were we feeling good. Anyhow, yeah, but I saw her go by and I thought, gosh, that, I'm pretty sure that's the girl who's just started attending our church from Texas. And I was talking to them out there in front and, and um, I was thinking about all of you who might not know um, uh, Pastor Jim LaFoon. Those of you that have been here for a number of years, he's, everybody knows and there's no introduction that I could make. You know that we are very good friends, like very good friends. And, um, uh, and so 25 years or so now we've walked together and done things together in the movement called Every Nation. And, and, um, and then he's been in here several times to speak and minister to many people here. And, uh, but I thought, what would I want somebody to know? Because we tease a lot. Jim and I tease a lot. We have a lot of fun together. We rode around in a car. And then we got tired of teasing each other. Somebody called that we knew. We put them on the phone and then tore them down for about 20 minutes. And they tore us back down. We just laughed and carried on and just had a ball. And, um, uh, and had a great time. But if you had never met Jim LaFoon, I know this is an introduction a little bit too long, so let me speed up. But you would need to know this, that probably no one in the every nation world, and that's, I don't know, how many, Jim, what do we have, 2,000 churches around the world? And uh, 2,000 churches around the world. Um, no one has been used more powerfully of God to stamp what I call the proper use of the supernatural into the movement than Jim LaFoon. When his life is over and, and he's got a long ways to go, but when it's all done, there'll be a brand in the every nation world that young men and women will have to figure out how they're gonna take that brand and make sure it lives on. But no one has brought greater respect, integrity, uh, and accuracy to the gift of the prophet than Jim LaFoon that I've ever known and met. It's just been amazing. It's, he's known, he travels the world, and the world looks to him as a gift from God. I'll tell you another thing you might not know about Jim, and hardly anybody would know this. I don't think anybody in the Every Nation Leadership Strata knows the Bible better than Jim LaFoon. There may be some, because I know some. Rice, he knows his Bible. and These are names you wouldn't know, but we have men who know their Bible pretty deeply. It's a word-driven movement every nation is. It's not an experience-driven movement. It's a word-driven movement. And, um, and man, Jim has references to places in Scripture, knows things about the Bible, and can make ready application of it like nobody I've ever seen. And, um, uh, and so he's unique. He's a gift. He's a friend. But I would want you to know you're not just listening to a guest speaker that's filling in time. And uh, we think today is special because we've never had to do this. This is the fourth shot at us. He had to cancel, I had to cancel, he had to cancel, I had to cancel. And then here we are. And we think today is special. And I just wanted you to know, listen with your ears, real keenly attuned to what the Spirit of God is saying to you. And uh, this man's a gift from God. And uh, I'm not going to take any time to do any teasing today. And, and I think sometimes you would miss the great respect that I have for Jim LaFoon because of the way we carry on with each other. Now, after the service, if you want to hang out and hear us, uh, that would be fine. That's when we make sure we don't get big-headed. And uh, so will you welcome Jim LaFoon to the platform this morning? Great to be here. And um, back when Russ and Debbie were in Midland, Texas, which is not quite as beautiful as Jacksonville, 
I used to come all the time there too. And he said, now that you came all the time in Midland, I'm gonna have you back in Jacksonville because I know you're coming for me. You know, I'm a little destabilized right now. That's the nicest introduction I've ever received here. I don't quite know what to do with it. Some of you know, I, of course, last time he gave me a nice introduction, he spoke real badly about me the next Sunday from what I understand. That's all right, I'm gonna enjoy it while I can. It's always great, my wife Kathy's with me. Many of you know her, and so great to be here with Russ and Debbie there. It's two of our life friends. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for South Point. I thank you for this message, Lord. Lord, you know this message is really hours and days old, and I pray you'd guide me as we speak to this church, Lord. Amen. I'm going to entitle this message, A Tale of Two Teams. I think we forget how young the disciples were. When you study ancient Jewish educational traditions, they started studying the scriptures at five years old. At 10, they were studying Jewish civil and ceremonial law. By 13, they were studying the first five books of the Bible. And if they were smart at 15, they got picked to go to rabbinical study, study with a rabbi who had to be at least 30 or they started their trade, and by 18, they were typically married. We know Peter was married. As for the rest, there's no evidence they were. We don't know. Um, we know when it was time to pay the temple tax, and they got the coin out of the fish's mouth. That was only enough tax for two of them, probably Jesus and Peter. Were they under 20? Who knows? But more than likely, they were young 20s, older teens. They're a bunch of kids. It was a senior high youth group with the greatest leader that's ever walked the earth. He was 30 at 12, he, he knew who he was fully. Five, he probably remembered creating the earth with his dad. And it was to a group of teenagers. He'd trust all of history. Group of kids. Peter may have been 25, they speculate. I know in our mind they're older. We look at things like Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper and they look at all these older guys with beards. That wasn't the case. They're kids. And when you understand they're kids, it helps you understand why they were so obnoxious, presumptuous, bragging, just helps you understand it. How many of you know young and dumb is understandable, old and stupid is not as easy to understand? <laughs> just not. So in John 16, 29 through 32, the disciples always thought they got it. Fact of it is, they never really did. His disciples said, ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we're sure you came from God. Jesus answered, so you finally figured out you really believe, okay? The hour is coming, indeed it's come, when every one of you will be scattered and run home and abandon me. And I'm not alone, my dad's with me. After three and a half years, with the greatest teacher to ever walk the earth, three and a half years of seeing miracles, extraordinary power, food multiply, no human eye has ever seen it. In a matter of hours, they were scattered, shattered, ran for their lives. Their leader, Peter, the oldest among them, denied and cursed three times, even cursed himself. Instead of I've ever known him, may God curse me. You look in the original text. Judas, the man they'd trusted with all their money, highly respected, had been stealing from them and betrayed. You've ever been betrayed by someone you love. That's a pain beyond comprehension. And the two places where betrayal hurts worse are natural family and spiritual family. Now you remember, and when I was in worship today, I, I felt some people in here had been betrayed. I could feel it. And you're hurting today. Let me share with you something. When we're betrayed, what the enemy is really after is not just the person that betrayed it, it's about the principle of trust. And when he betrays you, he wants to steal your ability to ever trust what that person represents. 
church, marriage, or family. They were shattered. When you look at their pre-resurrection, I mean, they were all boasting. Peter gets kind of all the, you know, the credit for being an idiot, but they're all boasting. Matthew 26, 33, 35, Peter said, man, I'll never deny you, the rest of these people. I'll never deny you, Lord. Trust me, I'm Peter the Rock. Rock head, better stated. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. No, I won't. And then the Bible says this, and all the disciples said the same. They had no idea what they were going to go through to become the men and the women with him as well who would one day change the world. They had no idea what God will put in his love, a family and a church through to get them ready to make a difference. That when God finds metal, he'll temper it. He'll put it in a furnace to bring an edge to it. Matthew 26, 40 through 45 and 56, they're in the garden. You know, Jesus told the three, can't you just stay awake and pray? He came and his disciples found them sleeping. That was his big three. Peter, James, and John. And when they finally came to take him, it said all the disciples left him and fled. Failed. Now, the thing that astonishes me is this. What Jesus could not do in three and a half years to mature 12 young men in 40 days Everything changed when he rose from the dead. How did it happen? How did Jesus, the greatest leader that ever lived, come to three and a half years of discipleship and they ran? And Peter, who denied, stood up with the very same group minus Judas on the day of Pentecost, faced persecution and changed the world. What happened? How does the Holy Spirit come in to our lives and change us? I want to talk to you now about the post-resurrection transformation of this team. Now, why would I do that? Why? Number one, the Holy Spirit told me to, and I believe it's because what we see going on in these lives is going on in this church as you come into the greatest moments you've ever experienced. Now, how many of you know if you just run and left Jesus, the last thing you'd want to do is see him again? They're all locked up. They're hiding. They're scared to death. They're ashamed. I mean, Peter feels like I'm done. I cursed him three times and denied him. I've lost everything. You ever felt like you've blown it to the point there's no recovery? I'm not even talking about sin. You just lack so much wisdom, there's no recovery. And now in John 20, 17, Jesus is gonna have his first conversation with one of his followers, which happens to be one of the Marys. He defines him. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Now many times we wanna cling to an old understanding of Jesus. We wanna cling, but God brings us on. Now watch this. Here's what he said to them. But go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my dad and your dad, to my God and your God. Now, if I'd have been just you go tell them idiots, I'm done with them. I'm fighting a new team. Like, where were they? They ran and left me. What did Jesus say? Regardless of what happened, regardless of how your week was, you're still my family. You go tell my brothers their failure didn't change family reality. You go tell my brothers, not my followers anymore. Something happened through the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus was not just their rabbi, he was their brother. And he said this, I'm going to my dad and your dad. No matter how your week was, no matter what you've gone through, family is not conditional in the Bible. It's the gift of God through your salvation. He said, Jesus says, let me establish something. Despite your failure, despite your weak, despite your pain, you're still my family. Despite what you've gone through, despite your worst failure. Then he says this, 
On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They're locked up. He's already risen from the dead. And the women have told him, two disciples who met him have told him, and yet they're still locked up. They're living as if he's not even been raised from the dead. And Jesus came and stood among them. What happened? He just walked through the wall, through the door, and said to them, peace be with you. He's standing in front of them. They still can't believe. Then he showed them his hands. That means he goes, see these nail marks? Then the Bible said he showed them his side. That means he takes his robe off, he pulls part of it up, and he shows them this massive, still healing hole in his side. And the Bible says, then they were glad. Then they were glad. You say, man, how could they not believe Jim when they saw him? Because when you've been betrayed, when you failed, when you've been hurt, it makes you begin to think, is everything I saw an illusion? Was there really family? Could I really trust again? Did it really happen? And he realized it. Even eight days later, Thomas told him, he said, listen, I'm glad you saw him, but if I can't put my finger in his hand, if I can't stick my fist into his side, I won't believe. Eight days later, he appears. He says, Thomas, come stick your finger in my hand. He said, Thomas, come stick your hand in my side. That's why in 1 John they said, that which we've heard, that which we've seen, that which we've laid our hands on, we now preach to you. Beloved, he's so patient to develop your faith. You may say, Jim, I just know Jesus is sick of my unbelief, not as sick of it as you might think. He understands your frame. Today, no matter where you are, you say, man, it just seems like an illusion to me, Jim. I've hurt so much, I thought I could count on it. I've gone through this. I hear Jesus saying, touch me. Come a little closer. I'm patient. What is so stunning is, I mean, us as humans, if our best friends would have just run and cursed us, not Jesus. You're still my family. Let me develop your faith. Come and touch me. Come and be around me. You see, your perceptions will mess you up. It's because when there's been an explosion in your life or a failure in your life or someone's betrayed you, you don't believe what you see anymore. And the only answer to that is, come touch me. Come touch me. Now, here's amazing. Then he directs them. He said to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them. What is he saying? Regardless of what's happened, regardless of your failure, regardless of what you've gone through and how broken you've become, I'm still sending you. Your omission does not cancel your commission. Do you understand that? Your omission, your problem does not change your commission. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And what, he did not, what they did not realize in their breaking, it's why he said, listen, you're gonna be scattered. You're gonna be broken. Why? In your breaking is your making. In your breaking is your making. You say, man, pastor, I've sinned. Your omission does not cancel your commission. I'm sending you. I'm using you. I'm using you. I hear you had people with bullhorns here last week. Let me tell you this. I, I hear some of them had been in the church. One of them minimally will return and repent and rejoin you as a sign to what I'm saying. You watch and see. Now listen, omission never destroys commission. Then he breathes on them. In the Greek, that's the word dunamis. He empowers them. It's where we get dynamite from. When he breathed on them, I believe, and scholars go back and forth, he was creating that new nature, and later they were baptized in the Spirit. I'm not going to go into the theology, but let me say this. He breathed on them. Some say, well, it was just symbolic. If the resurrected Savior breathes on you, how many of you, that's not symbolic. If he breathes on you, something happens. The power of the Holy Spirit hit them. Dynamited them. Never underestimate power of the Holy Spirit. You know what changed in 40 days on the, on the day of Pentecost? They got, then the, after, after 40, then the day of Pentecost, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit 10 days later. Baptized in the Spirit. Like it's a 50-day period. 
baptized in the Spirit. Now, I want to cut now into John 21. He's got their faith back up, but they're still discouraged. How did he deploy him? After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. What does that mean? I pretty much lost my ministry. I pretty much lost my anointing. I denied Peter, still pretty broken. I'm going back to the one thing I know. I'm going back fishing. And literally they realize Jesus is setting them up. We'll go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Remember, they fished with tamil nets in those days. They were made out of white linen. You never fish by day with them because the fish could see the nets. They fished by night. This is taking us back to Luke 5 where they'd fished all night and caught nothing just as the day was breaking. That means they'd fished all night and all of a sudden the sun began to come up over the Sea of Galilee, still dusky, you couldn't really see, and Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Typically, when a new day is coming into your life, when a new day is coming into your marriage, and Jesus is standing to bring you to that new day, at the beginning of the new day, it's not quite light enough to hear him, see him, but you can only hear him. So I was reading this passage, here's what I tell you by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is standing to call this church into a new day of effectiveness. Watch this, it's just too dark to see him. But I want you to hear his voice. He's standing in front of your marriage, standing in front of this church, and here is what he's saying. Jesus said to him, Children, do you have any fish? Children, do you have any fish? You see, why do you think we were left down here, beloved? What is this all about? I mean, we can worship in heaven. We can fellowship with heaven. He says, do you have any fish? And we know from Luke 5, he's not just talking about natural fish. Do you have any fruit? And I hear him saying, standing in front of this church, a new day is coming. Do you have any fish? A new day is coming. Do you have any souls? A new day is coming. What about your neighbors? Now watch this. They answered him, no. Now here is the astonishing thing. His answer is astonishing because when they had, in Luke 5, when they first met him, they had to go back out into deep water. They had to go out and let their nets. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. What is Jesus saying? You feel like you're broken. You feel like I've left you. Never have you realized in your brokenness, I finally got you where I want you. And with one small adjustment, you'll come to the harvest of your life. One adjustment. I mean, he looked at it and said, have any fish? They said, no, no fish. He said, just switch sides. Just go to the right side. See, in their minds, they were done. In their minds, because of their brokenness, because of their failure, because of what they'd gone through, they were farther from his will than ever before. In reality, in that brokenness, they were closer. Just switch sides. Just switch sides. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now this is profound because they're reliving Luke 5. And in Luke 5, they had not really believed the harvest was possible. They didn't they'd have, they'd have any fish. They didn't have the nets ready. You remember the nets broke. They lost it. Now they're in a giant harvest. They can't even drag it into the boat. There's such a harvest. And in one moment, John realizes the disciple whom Jesus loved. And how many of you know John's fairly arrogant himself? Who else would write a book of the Bible and always remind us, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved? I, I mean, come on. He's as bad as Peter, just sneaky. Okay. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, it is the Lord. Now I want to cut down. We're talking about a group, but I want to look through the lens of Peter's life 
to watch now how Jesus transforms you. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. What happened? When Peter realized, I've not lost my harvest. I've not lost my promise. I denied him three times. And it's still here for me. See, many of you live under the lie, Jim, I've lost my harvest. I've not lost my salvation, but my kids are never gonna come out right. My marriage is never gonna be right. It's never gonna be right. And in that one moment, Peter realized, I still gotta catch. Despite everything, I still gotta catch. Despite failing him, man, three and a half years before he promised me this, and now at the lowest point in my life, it's come back. Do you realize it? The great catch came back at the lowest point in their life, at their lowest ebb, at their most broken. Why? So only God could get the glory. He, he just forgot himself. He threw himself into the water. So, man, Jesus didn't even care about his catch, didn't care about his harvest. He threw himself into the water. You see this Jesus, this Jesus, at your lowest point, you see, at your lowest point, it's finally safe for him to use you. Finally safe. Many of you live under such lies. Well, I know I'm saved, but it's too late for my kids. Or, you know, we were unsaved a long time. Our marriage was messed up. Listen, don't believe that lie. The new day just hasn't dawned enough for you to see him fully. Just hasn't dawned enough for you to see him fully. He stood on that shore. Any fish? No. One little adjustment. Just follow me. You know the story. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Although there were so many, the net was not torn. This is profound. Why, when he said, bring the net in, did Peter go and get it? What 10 men could not do, one man did. What was that all about? It was about two things, beloved, hear me now. Number one, it was about Peter needed to realize, despite all of your pain, your purpose is still there. He goes, he's so broken. I mean, he is denied, beloved. He's failed. He goes and he begins to drag that net, and as he drags that net, the strength of God pulling it in, all the disciples realize, even though he failed, he's the leader. He's still bringing that net in. They all knew he denied. They all know he tried to behead a man and only got an ear. I mean, they knew what a failure he was. He bragged the most. Jesus is getting ready to turn a bunch of teenagers over to a 25-year-old denier. Change. All of human history. Young 20s, full of themselves, led by a denier. Second thing, this touches me the most. See, once God begins to show you your purpose, then it becomes about your place. Well, I know God can still use me, but like, will it really ever be the same? Will it be the same? When they got to the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place. Why is this charcoal fire so important? You remember in John 18, 17 and 18, when Peter had finished denying, the Bible says he went and warmed himself by the charcoal fire with those who had arrested Jesus. And when Peter saw that charcoal fire, all the memories came back. I denied him there. I was just with his enemies. Jesus sees Peter sitting by that charcoal fire. Now, now, none of the disciples dare ask him, who are they? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to him the fish. What happened here? He said, Peter, come take your place by the fire. It's okay. But I, but I denied you by a fire like this. All this pain. You see, Jesus will take you right back to the point of greatest pain and meet you where you are and embrace you. Come by the fire. Come on. Come by the fire. Now, you see, it's interesting. What had God just done to Jesus? 
He'd define him. Okay, you're still my family. I'm going to redevelop your faith. You've not lost your purpose. You've not lost your place. He secured their souls and Peter's soul, and now he's going to confront him. You see, we're such in a hurry to confront people. And God is so wise that he'll secure you before he confronts you. He'll secure you. And now he's going to bring Peter aside. He's going to tell him the three things that will save his life. Pulls him aside. And he finishes breakfast. He says, Simon Peter. Now, why would he call him Simon Peter all of a sudden? Remember when he met him, he said, you're Simon. One day you'll be Peter. It's because how many of you know many times Christianity feels like a teeter-totter? On Monday, you're kind of on the Simon side. Tuesday, you're kind of back to being Peter. Wednesday, you're kind of in the middle figuring out which you're going to give in to. He goes, Simon Peter. Then he goes, Simon, son of John. Now, he just got through telling him, I'm going to see my dad. What is he saying? He's saying, Simon Peter, I'm going to help you figure out who you are today. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Why did he say that? Because multiple times Peter said, I love you more than them. They're going to deny I'm not. Jesus goes, look around. Was your love really greater than theirs, Peter? Was it really greater? Peter knew the answer. They ran. He denied. They're around the charcoal fire. Was it really greater? He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. It's Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, lest, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? One for every denial. How did Peter take that? Because God, Jesus had spent hours and hours, even days, reminding him, you're still my son. You're still my brother. I still have a purpose. Now he's breaking him down. Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And then he positions him. You see, beloved, once Jesus fixes a break in your soul, if you don't let him put you in holy traction, you'll never learn to walk right. If you don't let him cast you right. See, many Christians, they got a break, break in their marriage, break in their life, break in their soul. Great purpose, God still loves them. But because they refuse to submit to what I'm going to tell you now, they limp forever. He said, truly, truly. Now, this is counterintuitive. Truly, truly, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you want. You know what that means? When you were young, you were self-defined, son. No one could really tell you the truth. You wouldn't hear it. I mean, son, remember, I told you you're going to deny me, and you argued with me. When you were young, you dressed yourself anywhere you want, and you went wherever you wanted. You see, to us, well, that's being an adult. I'm defining myself. No, that's being a teenager. I'm defining myself. I'm dressing how I want. I'm wearing pants that hang around my knees. I'm doing what I want. I don't care what you think. What is this, beloved? See, when you're young, no, 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 our eyes, maturity is I dress how I want. I dress how I want. I go where I want. And Jesus, that's immaturity. When you're old, son, I'll know you're mature when you stretch out your hands and your friends can dress you. I'll know you're mature when other women can speak to you, sister, and say, I'm concerned about how you're raising your kids. I know you're mature when your brothers can come and say, if you treat your wife that way, you might lose her. I'll know you're mature when you don't dress yourself anymore. Well, you know, I'll know you're mature when someone else can look at you and say, I wouldn't wear that, I wouldn't do that. Why? Maturity is not being self-defined. Maturity is not walking any way you want. He said, Peter, listen to me. You would not let me define you. I told you you would deny me. I told you you argued with me. Peter, if you just would have listened, and I know you didn't believe me because you never prayed. You thought that was maturity? And it got you here. And it got you here. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. That means willingly. You know why I walk with, you know why I love walking with Russ? 
It says like it is. He's not self-defined and walk where he wants. There's no truth I couldn't speak to him and he couldn't speak to me. I trust a man like that. You see, in our mind, when I grow up, I'll do what I want. That's not growing up. When you grow up, you'll do what's right. Want. I mean, how many of you learn once you left the teen years and had to go out in the real life, that's when it got hard. Being a kid is about doing what you want. Being an adult is about doing what's right. When you grow up, people will define you, Peter. When you grow up, you listen. And he said this, and another will dress you and they'll carry you where you don't want to go. If you're only led where you want to go, you won't go where much. I find God continually leads me where I don't want to go. Apologize, repent, humble yourself. Now, I'm not quite sure the Holy Spirit led us to Maple Biscuit, but that's another message. <laughs> we sure enjoyed it. He said, Peter, I'll know you're mature where I can carry you where you hate to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Now, that meant, yes, a lifestyle, but also he was crucified. And history tells us when they said, we're going to time to him to be crucified by the Romans. Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. Crucify me upside down. After saying this, he looked at Peter and he said, do you still want to follow me? Because the kid games are over, son. For three and a half years, I tolerated self-definition and willfulness. But if you're going to follow me into the catch, I just let you touch. If you're going to follow me into this harvest, someone else has got to dress you. You've got to be willing to be carried by my spirit and by the brothers, by the sisters, to where you don't want to go. Okay, first of all, he deals with the, the compound fracture of denial. Then he casts it then basically comes along and puts in kind of a holy traction, gives him a walking boot, whatever you want to call it. And now he deals with the third thing that'll get you. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Whoa, won't comparison get you? Won't that other brother get you? Sneaky John back there trying to eavesdrop on him. He saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Listen, John gets his beatings later. Don't, don't, don't doubt it. I mean, God honest, would you write a book calling yourself the disciple whom Jesus loved? Give me a break. That's not exactly humility. And that, now John wants us to make sure we know who he really is. The disciple whom Jesus loved, he was also the one who leaned back on Jesus during the supper. I mean, he's the one that kind of had the big seat. He was also the one that kind of had to ask who was going to betray him. When Peter saw him, he said, Jesus, what about him? He's as bad as I am. He's just sneaky. He's just quieter. We grew up together. How can you treat me this way and him that way? That'll kill you every time. What about them? It's never the question in prayer. What about me? What about them? I, I laugh sometimes with Pastor Russ and Pastor Phil. We go, my goodness, I said, you think by the, as old as we are, the devil wouldn't waste his time anymore. What about so-and-so? I'm so tender. Why am I going through this? I mean, I love my friend. I doubt he knows there's a devil. What's fair about that? What about old Slippery John? <laughs> now, Jesus, Jesus is not giving Peter any grace. Jesus said to him, huh, what if he never dies? Peter goes, think, what? Yeah, what if I just let him live forever? Is that going to bother you? Is it going to bother you when you're crucified that old John is going to live forever? Now, Jesus never said he's going to live forever. He's messing with him. Watch this. If it's my will that he never dies, will that bother you? If you don't feel like I'm treating you fairly, if you're not blessed like so-and-so, and you think, well, they're not really raising their kids right, and look at their kids, and I did everything right, what happened? Be glad life's not fair. Be glad God's merciful and just. 
So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Who do you think spread that saying around? John. I don't want to brag, brothers, but I, I shouldn't really say this, but I overheard Jesus saying I was never going to die. It didn't surprise me. He didn't die. He, stayed, he laid up there on Patmos all alone for a while. That's another story. But I never said he wasn't going to die. Just said, what if it's my will? Let me summarize this. God's building a dream team here. It's just not the way you expected. It's not how you think it works. It's not. No matter how you've been broken, what you've gone through, he still says, you're my sibling. We share the same dad. No matter how feeble your faith is, he doesn't just say, ah, you're filled with unbelief. He says, put your hand on my side. Touch my hand. I know you've gone through enough where it seems like an illusion. Oh, and by the way, your omissions not cost you my commission. Things you didn't do. Got it. And that great harvest I showed you, I'm bringing it back at your weakest point. My promise is not based on you. It's based on me. You've not lost your purpose. You've not lost your place. Come on down by the charcoal fire. But Lord, it's too painful. It's like I sat with your enemies there. I've already forgiven you. Once he secures your soul, then he kind of deals with the breakdown. You're a little arrogant. You thought you loved me more than all the brothers and sisters. Look how that turned out. And by the way, if you're going to walk out this repentance, you can't define yourself anymore. You just can't do it. And you're going to have to go to some places you never wanted to go. You want a good marriage? Go to the cross. I'm sorry. Where are good marriages start? The cross. Kathy and I have been married 40 years we race to the cross to see who will repent first. It's the way it should be. That's what I love about Russ and Debbie. I know where they are. They're in their Bible every day. I know where my wife is. I know how to find her every morning. She's in that Bible. Listen, if I mistreat her, which has happened maybe once or twice in 40 years, <laughs> give or take a couple thousand times, she, she doesn't say to me, come spend time with me. She says, go spend time with God. I don't want to be around you. Go get in that Bible. Go get in prayer. Oh, and the enemy will try to use another person to stumble you. There'll always be that person he tries to use to affect you. You know what's pretty incredible, and I skipped this phrase. See, with that great catch, the net didn't break. Three and a half years before, the net had broken. Now at their weakest point, it didn't break. I see Jesus standing in front of marriages, individuals, this church. For some of you, it's a bit too dark to see him, but you can hear him. Got any fish? Got any fruit? You say today, I want to come into everything Jesus has for me. Just stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. You say, I'm in that journey, Jim. You're talking about me today. I need his touch. I'm broken. Holy Spirit, join me up here, Pastor Russ. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this church. Thank you for South Point Community Church. And you're standing on a shore to bring them into destiny. You're creating a dream team here, freed from illusion, not self-defined. Many of them coming out of the low ebb. It does not matter. Bring them into everything you have for them. I call this great church. I call this great people into everything you have for them. Lord, I call them into harvest. I call them into blessing. You've given them great purpose, great place. Thank you for the privilege of being here, Lord.